Mrs. Jean Marie Ward for Continual, the convention that never ends. Today, we'll be spending an hour with Murr Lafferty, the Manly Wade Wellman award-winning author of such books as Six Wakes, The Shambling Guide to New York, Ghost Train to New Orleans, and Station Eternity, as well as more podcasts that I can count. Also, more awards for more podcasts than I can count. <laughs> Hello, Mer. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're thrilled. We're absolutely thrilled. Um, you know, this is going to be a writing, primarily a writing uh, mm -hmm. interview. So could you tell us, when did you first know you wanted to be a writer? I was a voracious reader as a kid. And, um, but I never really wanted to start writing until I started reading science fiction and fantasy, specifically by women with women or girl uh, protagonists, um, dragon flight. Uh, great. Now they all leave my head. Uh, a wi uh, science. <sighs> a win in the door. What's the first one? Why Anne can't McCaffrey. I remember? Well, no, Anne McCaffrey and Madeline LaEngle and, um, yeah, those were two big ones. Um, yeah, so w once I saw women writing stories about women and girls, I'm just like, that just suddenly I'm just like, I want to do this. And that that got me really excited. So uh, my dad says I was writing earlier than that, but I remember really wanting to be a writer when I started reading those. Yeah, it was a certain explosion, it felt like, in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm that suddenly women were bringing their voices to science fiction and fantasy. And uh, um, Anne McCaffrey was the first woman science fiction writer to make the New York Times bestseller list. Mm -hmm. Other really important achievement. Was humor always a part of that or is that also something that came a little later? I I think, it, I, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't sit down to write a funny thing um, you know, when I tell stories, it just kind of grows in that direction. So I think I was writing funnier stuff when I was younger. Um, but it's, it's been, it's sometimes difficult to, to push the humor out as some of my editors have requested, but not entirely because that's my voice. But, um, you know, when I got into darker things like murders, uh, they asked me to, lighten up a little bit or rather not lighten up a little bit on the humor, darken up but, a little bit yeah <laughs> but uh yeah I mean I've always I've I've always enjoyed humor Douglas Adams um was a really big influence on me um and I didn't even realize it until someone made a comment when Shambling Guide came out how much it was like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and I'm like how did I miss that it was I was astonished embarrassed that I'd missed it um but yeah, so the the humor, Pratchett and Adams had a big influence on me as well. So I think their humor's kind of uh, infiltrated me. Uh, sat down to watch A Fish Called Wanda with my husband, and that was one of my favorite movies growing up. And he just looked at me and he's like, I understand you and your humor so much more now. <laughs> like, oh, I guess I guess that was a big influence on me too, huh? So yeah, Monty I, Python as well. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh, I used to go to a lot of mystery conventions many years ago, and uh, either Carolyn Hart or Charlotte McLeod um, were two big writers in the 80s, and they, cozy writers, and one or the other of them sat in a panel and said, they say I'm funny. I don't understand it. I'm not funny. <laughs> And so every time, you know, oh, no. I like that, uh, like it just comes in, I think of that particular panel because sometimes it's not something you even try. Yeah. You know, you're not trying for it's your voice. So uh, how did you go from there to getting into the publishing industry? I understand that you started with the gaming industry or did I get that? Yeah. Right? No, no. I started uh, writing for role-playing games around... 2001, I guess. 2000 or 2001. A friend of mine had just left White Wolf. He had a lot of connections in the industry. And so he got me an introduction to somebody and I got one small job and they liked what I did. So I kept working. 
Um, it took me a while to get, but I mean, fiction was always my dream. And then podcasting came along and I heard some people were doing, you know, were, were podcasting their fiction. And I was nervous to do that because I thought that would and uh, take up first print first rights. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, but then when they started building these massive audiences, I thought, well, I'm not going anywhere with my fiction. I might as well just give it a try. Mm -hmm. um, and I built, uh, I built the audience. I got um, a small press deal for my very first book called Playing for Keeps, which was a superhero, sort of a slapstick superhero book. And then um, other editors started noticing me and I got invited to submit to somebody um and I guess 2011 and so I did and that was a shambling guide to New York City so that's how I got into traditional publishing did writing for uh the ear uh change the way you wrote your fiction did it uh have Probably. different <laughs> it's okay. hard to say yeah um I am also co-editor of Escape Pod, which is the podcast science fiction magazine. And the way we read is very different because we can read a brilliant story, but it might not be right for audio and we'll have to reject it. Um, like stories with really slow beginnings, stories with uh, that are experimental or heavy on uh something you have to see something on the page something computerish or you know stuff that your eye will just gla glance over and accept okay this is a computer thing that a narrator would have to go read the whole path out and and things like that um i tend to write spare um descriptions really hard for me and i don't know if just the fact that dialogue's easier for me is why I enjoyed writing for audio so much or if it went the other way, but um, getting more to the point and more dialogue and less uh, description, which is a weakness. I'm not saying I don't like good description. I'm just saying it's really hard for me. So um, that makes writing for audio easier. Mm -hmm. What was the most important thing it taught you as a writer? I would think the pacing, you know, the need to. Yeah. Would yeah, be tight really pacing is important. And it, it, you want to keep people reading the next, the, the next, thing, or listening to the next thing. Um, yeah, pacing is, is interesting to me because I remember, I won't say who because I really hated the book, but I read a book by an author whose pacing was so tight that I hated it. I hated the, the story, but her pacing was so good that I couldn't put it down. It was just like a hate read. And I was up till <laughs> two and I'm like, I'm not enjoying this, but I can't stop. It was, but I would love to take a, a class on pacing from her because she was amazing. I just never want to read one of her books again. <laughs> yeah, that, that can be a real problem. I, I, I look at, you know, folks who've gone through MFAs and fiction as you have. And go, but you have to read all sorts of stuff you don't like. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, ours said you didn't have, you know, you had to get like 100 pages in. Um, but when you write, we, like for the lectures, to prepare for the lectures, but then for our reading uh, during the resident, we had a low residency program. So we'd go to class for 10 days and then go home for six months. Um yeah, during during the home study, we had to read a bunch of stuff. And I actually found that my best um, deep reads were of the books I didn't like because I had to explain what I learned from them and tell in a intellectual way what I didn't like about them. So, you know, I, I that, that way I found I, I could learn from something I didn't like um, because I know Gene Wolfe was brilliant, but I don't like really don't like the the, <laughs> the new sun books i just don't uh, i had the same problem i yeah knew he was brilliant intellectually and went there's nothing in here for me yeah i mean it's uh, it is very much technically expert mm -hmm. and i can see why people would like it but there's nothing in here for me uh, yeah and that's reading is such an emotional connection with the work it's not just about how brilliant the person is who's the writer. It's mm -hmm. 
do these people speak to you? Do they, you know, are there girls? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's kind of small. There, yeah. are, you know, and I understand totally the need for own voices because for so many years there there were only one there was only one kind of hero mm -hmm. and most of the world wasn't it mm -hmm. and you know so and hero to me is a gender neutral word so you know, but we get further down on that road but oh, yeah well, that's that's a conversation for a bar right <laughs> how um how easy was it to you know go from this very tightly paced very episodic format podcasting storytelling to going back to traditional novels on on a page that you turn or flip in a in a reader well i think you know a good if you're good at writing episodic then you're going to be able to take that i mean that's just good pacing again um so taking that pacing skill and putting it into a novel that people can't put down um that's the goal the biggest challenge was again putting description in to slow the pace down and give people more than a white room to think about mm -hmm. um so that was that was my biggest thing i remember with uh ghost train to new orleans i remember writing the the climax and i was I felt like I was sweating blood. I was just working so hard to make that scene so vivid. And my editor came back and said, I love this scene. I'll make the rest of the book like that, <laughs> which just made me want to cry. So yeah, it's, it's, it's slow, slowing down the pace and picking up the description was, it was a challenge I had to uh, get over and I still struggle with, but you know, we've did, all got our weak parts. Yeah. Did did it help any that New York and New Orleans are both cities you love? Um, kind of. I um, I visited. I I visited New York for a couple of things. I visited New Orleans specifically for, um, the book, the the second book, and um. It was fun being that those books are about a woman who writes travel books for monsters. I could just happily leap into any sort of tourist thing that I wanted to do and wouldn't have to like worry about finding like the the the, the really good places that the tourists don't know about. No, I wanted the touristy things because I wanted to tell those stories in a monster point of view. And um, so that was a lot of fun. I am not a very good traveler. I'm not, I don't have a good sense of direction. I get lost. I, you know, I love the idea of going and experiencing these cities for all they have. And, but know that, you know, me personally, not good at it at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I planned on, uh, Others, you know, I wanted to take the series longer and I planned on other cities that I either loved or um, I found fascinating. Um, but that didn't, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But uh, I did have plans on both stuff that, that I wanted to visit and uh, stuff that I had visited and made an impact on me. And someone wrote me a really long blog post uh sort of campaigning for Columbus to be one of the new one of the new shambling guides which I just thought was hysterical because they said I mean not hysterical like I was laughing at them they I'd been to Columbus it's a fine city but they just sent me so much really interesting information about the city it was a really good argument yeah I know I, I've been to Columbus and it's not the first place you would think of mm -mm. as a haunt for monsters but I can but one of the things about the pandemic here was I wound up you know, checking out my hometown, walking mm -hmm. it, walking it, because just to do something that wasn't, you, you weren't like this with other people. Yeah. And I found so many things. And I think everybody, you know, this would have been way before the pandemic. Uh, but uh, I think that every town has, has something the rest of us out here mm -hmm. in the other parts of the country wouldn't be uh, uh, aware of but to get back to the shambling guides and both um 
the original guide and Ghost Train to New Orleans have a very strong connection to Hurricane Katrina. I know you've told this story mm -hmm. many, many times, but would you mind sharing it again with our viewers here at Continual? Sure. Um, back in 2005, you know, after um, Katrina, some uh, game designers I knew, I was, you know, still doing work in RPG circles, said, you know, we could all get together and write just like play, we could write just sort of generic rules about putting a campaign in New Orleans, and then we could sell it and um, benefit the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I got the idea of a woman who loved, who was a travel uh, a tour guide, and she loved her job so much that she kept doing it after she died. And so I wrote like a, I don't know, 6,000 word, you know, look at New Orleans from the point of view of visiting zombies or visiting uh, vampires. And that's what kind of got it lodged in my mind. And... um so I wanted to do New York, but I'd always planned on going back to New Orleans. The funny thing was, um, book two was going to be about Boston because I was interested in the big dig because it was such a mess that, yeah. that you know, it would, took so much more time and money than they thought it would, et cetera. And I could think of a whole bunch of reasons why underneath the ground of what demons they ran into, um, to deal with that so uh but i had sold um rights to us and uk and so i had an editor in the uk and editor in the us and uh both orbit orbit us and orbit uk and my orbit uk editor didn't said that boston was not an international enough city and i don't know if they were just mad about the tea or what <laughs> but they they were not, they just did not think Boston was an interesting enough city to base my book in. And I'm like, okay, well, I was going to go to New Orleans for the third book. And they're like, oh, that sounds good. So I had to quickly rethink everything. And I'd already planned on a trip to Boston for research. And my husband had really wanted to go. So we took that trip anyway. But then I took like a whirlwind road trip down to New Orleans. Um, in November mm -hmm. just to get a better sense of the city. Cause I'd only, I'd only been once, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was, that was entertaining finding out that, that I, I thought Boston was a pretty international city, but <laughs> I guess well, I was wrong. Boston, I don't know. Boston was, well, I, I think it's, we, we all have blinders with other countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, if you ask how many books by Americans are set, uh, who write in English, you know, write books set in England, how many of them actually happen any place except London? Yeah. Not I a mean, lot. Yeah. And when uh, people who are not from the United States or Canada, because we have a bit better understanding of mm -hmm. each other, um, but if they're not part of this landmass, when they look at the U.S., they tend to see New York, uh, New Orleans and Los Angeles. Yeah. And La and New Orleans only because of the big party. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of see it. It's tragic because yeah. there's so much interesting stuff yeah. going on. But um, you know what? I keep I keep hoping for a steampunk story set in England that is not in the big in the big smoke. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Please, somebody out there. <laughs> But uh, were you surprised when these two books were the ones that won Manly Wade Wellman Awards, you know, here, which is all about excellence in science fiction and fantasy in North Carolina, you know, by North mm -hmm. Carolina writers, North Carolina being front and center. Talk about a place that they don't know outside the country. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, being front and center in that award. Was it a surprise when your name was announced in two successive years for two successive books? Oh yeah, yeah, it, it was a surprise, and you know, I'm I'm I've never lived anywhere else but North Carolina. I uh, 
and I put it, usually my main characters are from North Carolina and just end up going <clears throat> to New York or uh, a space station or something because I I can write, <laughs> like I said, I don't have a very visual memory. It's, it's easy for me to write about the things I see every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then um, try to remember a really big city, but, you know, I definitely would not have been able to sell the Shambling Guide to Charlotte or Ghost Train to Durham. It's just really no one cares about those cities. So, um, you know, I had I had to go bigger than that. I would have loved to do some like short stories that were more regional. Um, but yeah, I it's hard for me. It was a huge honor. I mean, you know, I've I've everyone's got their own look homeward angel issues with their home I suppose but uh I still love it here enough to continue living here and it's hard to hear your own voice so I don't even know if I bring forth a North Carolinian voice I don't know what that is but um you know I often bring the state into what I work on even if it's soon to go even if the characters soon go back to the stars but um yeah, I've got I've got people from the mountains of Tennessee, which is like eight miles from where I grew up in North Carolina, um, in Station Eternity, and so there's some, and I I put the Linco Viaduct in um, Station Eternity as well, mm -hmm. so which was fun because I got to be inside that bridge right after they built it, and apparently you can't do that anymore. <laughs> but yeah, yeah it was it, we got to wander the the length of the bridge of the Linco Viaduct after it had been. Took a class trip out there to wander the inside of a bridge. Mm -hmm. They're really strange places, aren't they? Very much. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I haven't been uh, in a North Carolina bridge, but uh, there are certain bridges in the Washington D.C. area that were tourable once upon a time, mm -hmm. and the internet still gives you access to the now closed off interior spaces, but. How would you say that being from North Carolina has influenced your writing, the way you put words on the page, maybe the legends you heard growing up? How how, how has that played into things? Oh, gosh. That's really hard to say. I, it, 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 I don't know if I can answer that construct, not construct, concretely, because, you know, you're, um, like I said, I didn't, I didn't even know Douglas Adams was influencing me until someone else mentioned it in a book review. Um, you know, I grew up in a tiny town in the mountains <clears throat> and my family was a big influence on me. Um, I think those, the, the people you meet in small towns, both the ones you like and the ones you don't like are, you know, make it into your fiction, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, my grandmother was a badass, and I think I try to put a flavor of her in every book I write. Um, but as for just regional stuff, I, I I don't know if I can say it's hard. Like I said, you can't. It's hard to hear your own voice or hear your own accent or hear your own style on the page. It's just weird. Mm -hmm. Hey, there are no wrong answers here. It's just a conversation with you know. Okay, let's let's look in this direction. Let's shift in that direction a little bit. Going back to the whole awards thing, you've won lots of awards and, you know, all the big sci-fi ones, plus Manly Wade Wellman, plus the Parsec Awards, which you helped found. Yes. Oh, how have, how has, have awards uh, influenced your career? Have they pushed you in directions you didn't plan to go? Were they a step up? What, you know, how important is it for a writer to be recognized by their peers or by the fans with an award? Um, it is, it, it's, I, I feel ridiculous for saying this because it's obvious it's a huge honor, of course. Um, with the Parsecs, it's so funny to think about how you feel like time is slipping away from yourself. Like, you know, I have to do this thing now because I'm running out of time. And then you look back and you're like, wow, did 
I didn't give that any time at all, did I? For, I? I'm bringing this up because, you know, we made the Parsec Awards because after podcasting got started, people started making podcasting awards, but nobody was doing anything for fiction and nobody was doing anything to focus on science fiction. And so um, I and Michael Armenengay and Tracy Hickman got together to try to remedy that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a big, big job and I never want to do it again, but um, it was, it was really cool to get that going. Awards are weird. They're, You want them so bad, and then you realize that usually your life doesn't change that much once you get them, but you can only say that from the comfortable point of view of having gotten it. Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, Ursula Vernon who did the math to figure out what a Hugo was worth to her because she tried to look at the numbers and see how a win affected her book sales. Mm -hmm. And But this was like before she got as big as she is now, right. but- um it 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 gets I, I think it gets you notoriety in a certain number of circles but not all of them like if you say you're uh you won the hugo for best novel that's it the rocket's the same size but people don't pay much of attention as to you won the pod the pod best fan cast the hugo for best fan cast kind of thing um but it's still just A lot of times you, if you're somebody like me, you avoid reviews because it's, it's, they're not meant for you. And usually they just tend to cripple me, um, either good or bad. I'll still just think about like what they said and what they got out of it and what they didn't get out of it. And, um, and I think nominations for awards, let you look outside yourself and see a sort of like more general positive view not anything specific and it's uh yeah that's nice writing for it the couple of times i've tried to focus my content to get awards i won't lie of course i have but uh nothing i don't think anything ever came of that it was you know making the content that i wanted to make that i felt passionate about and that showed you know, showed in my work and got more attention than just me trying to write something that people would like. So it, that's the double-edged sword of of content creation. Usually the stuff you really want people to pay attention to, they just don't care about. Yep. Speaking as a writer myself, not on the same level, but yep. Yeah. <laughs> always, always. Uh, you know, the stuff that you, you dashed off because you were mad at the editor, it's mm -hmm. the stuff that goes forward and you're going, what? Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, um, we'll get. Let's get back to the fiction, okay? Okay. There's a big shift in tone from mm -hmm. the Shambling Guide and Ghost Train, though they have really, you know, especially Ghost Train, really big climax, really intense, to Six Wakes, which is you a very twisty, uh, very complicated, and very all the experimental stuff you said that was really hard to carry off in podcasting, <laughs> that's in six ways. Yeah. What prompted you to go in that direction? Well, I worry you won't like my answer, but uh, the Shambling Guys didn't sell. Huh? I was, I was, I loved writing them, um, was delighted to get not, uh, uh, the nod from the Wellman Award. Um, very proud of them, but they didn't sell. And so, like I said, I'd, I'd planned out a couple of other things. I was really trying to figure out how to fit Emperor Norton from San Francisco into a shambling guidebook, but they didn't sell. And my editor said, um, you know, I think you're a good writer. Let's, let's focus on something else. So send me some pitches. And as we just said about the thing that you just dash off, I sent her three ideas and she liked the one that I cared least about, which was six wakes. Um, you know, I'd been watching mystery shows with my husband and we just thought it was so funny that nobody ever said, look, why do people keep dying around you? No, wait, no, that was Station Eternity. Oh man, I'm lost. Sorry. The Six Wakes, uh, that was, I wanted to tell a story about a generation starship, but I didn't want it to be like 
there were a lot of stories about people who'd either forgotten their goal or were remembered their goal, but they were descended so far beyond. And I was trying to figure out how to make a generation ship with the same crew for hundreds of years. And um, I was actually... <laughs> I was actually playing a video game that used cloning as um, bringing people back from the dead instead of uh, duplicating people. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting way of going about it and wondered if I could use that. So did that came to be that, that people had, you know, they, they live their lives, they drive the ship, they download their consciousness, they clone themselves and they keep going. And where the murder came from, I actually don't remember. But, you were watching uh, mysteries, weren't you? Yeah, we were watching mysteries at that time, yeah. But, um, and then I talked to a friend of mine, Dr. Pamela Gay, uh, who does a lot of education astronomy podcasts. And she very gleefully told me about everything that happens to bodily fluids in zero G. <laughs> and that really, really made my, um, made my first chapter something special, so... Yeah, yeah. Well, my my favorite uh, arguments I hear, you know, when I dip into science at that level is, can we have sex in space? Yeah, and can we reproduce? Because it it sounds like a stupid question, uh, but you know, if we can't re if it doesn't if the mechanics don't work, there's no point. But yeah, yeah I I mean I yeah, you see fluids in space and you go. What's that doing to the body? Yeah. I don't want to go there. Yeah. I don't want to go there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that was certainly in the first chapter, that feeling of, yes, oh, ouch, ow, mm -hmm. uh, was certainly in the first chapter of Six Wakes. Um, was it always intended to be as twisty as it is? Or no. did that just. No, I had been doing a lot of uh, reading on Agatha Christie, both her books and how she crafted her stories and figured, okay, well, she didn't know who the murderers were in half of her story. She just told them and made sure everybody got a motive. And I mean, I'm spoiling, worried about spoiling a book that's like, how old now? Uh, seven years old. I'll just say that I noticed that in every flashback I wrote, someone kept poke, po po someone kept uh showing up mm -hmm. and that's when i realized that it was it was twistier than i had originally intended and i was very happy with that like my mm -hmm. subconscious had been doing its job but um yeah i didn't set out to make it that twisty it just kind of happened as i was writing it mm -hmm. and uh does your subconscious often take a play in that you know, writers sometimes yeah. say, "I have, I'm in control." I oh no, definitely not. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm the kind of person that's just like, um, this never came to to pass. But I do remember, I just in in my first book, playing for keeps, I had people saying, "Oh yeah, my uncle was a lawyer," blah blah blah, and I'm like, suddenly, later on in the book, I wanted a lawyer, and I thought, I need that uncle, and um. It didn't end up getting in the book, I don't think, but I'd planned on using it in a, in a later one if I'd been allowed to keep telling that story. But little little things like that, just like throwing things you don't know what's going to come of them. Um, it, you know, it's not as obvious as Chekhov's gun, but, you know, putting different things into different scenes, figuring that you'll come back to it. And if you won't, well, people aren't going to care that there was a glass of lemonade on the table. Um, but if you can make that glass of lemonade on the table in chapter three, come back in chapter 17, people are going to be really impressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's all sleight of hand or yes. sleight of keyboard, as the, the saying goes. After something so uh, full of twists, turns, and um, bodily fluids, uh, was it a relief or a even bigger challenge to embark on the novelization of Solo? It was an interesting challenge. Uh, it, was, it was just a very different book. Um, I'd never done a novelization before, and it was, and you know, I love Star Wars, and so yeah. it was the biggest thrill to get that job. Um, I discovered a new challenge in writing, and I think it's only 
for people who write novelizations or translations um i mean translations between medium mediums i don't know about translations from languages but um there's like how to tell us how to describe a scene in a way that hasn't been done before because it literally has been done before and i was going off of the movie script and the ya novel and so i had to tell a scene a third way but still make it the scene that people saw and that was a big challenge and that's when i learned how to use point of view better because i could tell the same thing happened you know everything that happened in the movie happened in that scene but since it was from somebody else's point of view it looked different and that was a fun um project they and frankly i was surprised they let me do this but there were some problems i had with the movie that i tried to fix as best i could in the novel and i really thought they were gonna back me off of that but they didn't so you know i got to give l3's point of view when she uh joins with the falcon and give her a tiny bit more agency than she had um so it, that, you know, that meant a lot to me, being able to, you know, throw some canon things in there that that made it a little bit more palatable. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a huge thrill. And I was amazed at how much they allowed me to keep with the original work I did on that novel. Because oh, um, I threw Wars... a bunch of original stuff at them. And I figured they were just gonna like pick a handful of stuff that they wanted and toss the rest. But they only made me lose one whole scene. That's great because Star Wars is notoriously protective of the franchise. Yep. And how did you get into the franchise? Was this through your gaming um, contacts? Or? No, no, it was my agent. Uh, my agent knows the editor on the Star Wars novels. Cool. And uh, she knew I was a fan. So when the editor said, do you have anybody who's, you know, you think would be good for a Star, Star Wars book? She, she put me forth and I did... Uh, sort of test run I did a short story for Star Wars Insider before Rogue One came out yeah and that was fun because they really didn't give me much of anything <laughs> they give me like names and kind of what people are in general what people were doing at this time like what the Empire was doing at this time and so I just had to write up I just wrote a story about some spear carriers in the Empire and um yeah, but, but the, you know, she liked that. So she said, you know, when she had a novel she thought I'd be right for, she, she'd let me know. And that was Solo. So that was great. Great. And, of course, my favorite character in the whole thing. But that's just another thing. Uh, but, you know. Excellent. Uh, I, I grew up with the, uh, the generation of Harrison Ford as Han Solo. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. So that that was cool, that, absolutely cool. So you st you stuck with sci-fi uh, into mm -hmm. the next one, which, as we you mentioned earlier, was the murder she wrote meets Babylon Five the just dashed off pitch, or was um, it? Um, it it was. I I think eventually I want to challenge myself to do a contemporary story because. I wanted to write one where you hung a lampshade on the fact that people keep dying around this sleuth and people are not going to trust her or like her or feel comfortable around her. Um, but then I, my brain said, well, what would you do if that was you? And I thought, well, if there was a first contact situation and a space station that, <laughs> that humans weren't quite allowed to go to yet, maybe I'd run away there. And so that's where I took the the, you know, Nobody likes the sleuth, and so she runs away to be around aliens instead of people. So that that was the the elevator pitch there. And I don't think it's any surprise that murder follows her to the. Oh, stage. definitely, definitely, murder follows her. <laughs> what was the, what was the thing that, yeah, we all get to a point when we're writing, where, either we slog or there's something that basically explodes in our brain and says this is it this is this is the moment that i'm most proud of what was the thing that you liked best about this particular project station eternity I mean. oh gosh i loved building the aliens that was lots of fun um i think it was the fact that 
because I said you everyone if everyone points out why do murders happen around you um then the your book has to address that and I had not known why and I was talking to a friend of mine Christiana Ellis um and she's like of course you have to say why it is so you have to come up with it and I thought well dang <laughs> And, you know, again, I had done the the small spoiler, but I had done the thing of making this literal hive mind of of super intelligent wasps. And I thought, well, once I realized what they might be capable of, um, connecting that with my character was the big uh, bomb that said how everything fits together. Mm hmm and uh that was that was fun to to sort of structure yeah nobody ever says in miss marple or mm -hmm. you know in, in, in why everybody seems to die around her or jessica fletcher or any of the cozy sleuths that we it's like you don't want if you read cozy mysteries and i do mm -hmm. um you don't want to move to a small town. Those places You don't want to go to Father dangerous. Brown's church. Don't want to go to Father Brown's church. No way. No. Those are dangerous, man. I don't want to go there. Um, you know, we've mentioned some of the people that you, you've been influenced by. Douglas Adams, yeah, uh, Anne McCaffrey, um, the, um, and Agatha Christie. Did yes. you embark on reading more mysteries for things? for six uh, weeks, uh, excuse me, six weeks, mm -hmm. uh, six weeks, the uh, station eternity, or was it just part and parcel of the TV viewing and the other things that you were doing just sort of chilling out? No, it was, it was, I, when they said they wanted six weeks, I sat back and thought, I just sold a mystery. I don't know crap about mysteries. I was panicked. And uh, that's when I started really looking into Agatha Christie's work. And um, I know that a lot of the, a lot of mysteries that are written now are like very twisty psychological thrillers that I, I think I like the idea of, but I don't know if I could ever do. Mm -hmm. um, or they have like a, an element of, detective or police work that I don't have any interest in um I like some cozies um I I don't want to put down any sort of of genre but you know a, the, a lot of the cozies that go into animals or food I have re haven't really gotten into but um I'm reading one right now called Dead and Gondola about uh a uh women who own a, a mystery bookstore like they they love agatha christie's work and they have a mystery bookstore and then someone dies and they're trying to figure it out and there's a gondola as well but um so i i like cozies and but i i just really went because i liked her work and i wanted to learn from her i just read a lot of agatha christie and um you know some of her stuff is just freaking brilliant and sometimes you have to look past racism sexism classism anti-semitism but uh, i will say that recently there was a um a new miss marple collection by modern day writers and there's uh, i'm i'm gonna kick myself for, for i'm i can't remember all the authors who are doing who who write it but there is uh naomi alderman who's a jewish writer writes and there's a, a story about Miss Marple going to Hong Kong. And it kind of, it's it, a lot of these things address some of the things that Christy just wasn't real cool about. And um, that was, there, and all the stories are really good too. I'm not saying these are all just messages saying how Miss Marple was wrong. I mean, it's Miss Marple solving mysteries and uh, they're good. They're really good. So I, I recommend that that collection. I can't remember what it is, but if you look up any sort of Miss Marple collection that just came out in the past couple of years, um, it's like 13 new Miss Marple tales or something. But um, yeah, I, I just have, <laughs> I was listening to a podcast about uh, where a woman's 
doing a, a show on each Agatha Christie book. And the one I read, the, the one I listened to, she'd gotten a friend of hers to read Agatha Christie for the first time. And like the woman came on, she's like, I just wondered what's wrong with all of you. This is terrible. <laughs> and she was speaking at it from a point of view of it was cards on the table, which has a lot of it's a lot of bad things to say about someone who is of uh, questionable non-European descent. And it's just they, the, the, the term Mephistophelian, the adjective Mephistophelian is used more than once. I mean, it's just, yeah. So I, I just always have to say when I talk about studying Christie, it's just like there were a lot of things that were not cool about her books. But when it came to, you know, building a mystery she was phenomenal at it and i felt like she sat around with her little club friends and made all those rules of mysteries and then just sat back to figure out how many of them she could break which i admire yes well one always admires a trailblazer like that even if they have other issues um how did your experience at your academic experience help you analyze these better and help that, you know, translate the analysis to the page? Was that a, uh, something that was a plus? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, like you said, you have to read a bunch of stuff you don't want to read. And I was several, several years out of college. So was, was in a position again of having to read stuff that, that maybe I would have put down otherwise. And um, I think, Approaching a book and asking it what it can teach me was probably the biggest, one of the biggest things I learned from that, because you can get a lot out of even terrible books. Um, they usually have like Gene Wolfe writing as if he's, he's got a machete, he's wandering into the jungle. You can follow him or not. He doesn't care. He's just going to keep going. And if you don't understand, sorry, he's just going to keep going. I mean, that was some chutzpah that I had to admire, even though I, didn't follow him in a lot of ways he went but um it's just just a more uh wow the words leave me i'm sorry uh just just figuring out how to 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 read and learn from the novels even if i'm not enjoying it i think i resisted that a lot in my life and so um yeah mm -hmm. So we're, we're coming up towards the end, and I, I do have just a couple more questions. Okay. But, um, the both Station Eternity and its successor, um, Chaos Terminal, knowing publication schedules, I suspect they uh, were born in the the late medical unpleasantness, shall we say? Did the pandemic affect? the development of these novels oh, in yeah. any way and yeah, did it, it affect your writing of them yeah it was it was pretty bad um i remained healthy i was one of the lucky few um but you know just everything going on in current events just kind of ground me down and in that time, I'd also lost, uh, soon after I, the book was acquired, um, I was about halfway through writing it when my editor was laid off. Ooh. And then um, a couple of months later, my agent quit being an agent. So I was in the middle of the hell that was 2020. And um, with, with a new agent and a new editor, and I was having a really hard time writing. And um, the book, need, the Station Eternity needs, need, hmm, Station Eternity needed so many rewrites that uh, they took it off the list. They're just like, look, just we're not going to even pressure you. We're just going to take it off the list, and then you finish it. And when we're happy with it, we'll put it back on. Which means it's like they were satisfied with the final draft in 2021, but publishing schedules being what they are they couldn't they then couldn't put it on the schedule until fall of 22 right. so um so like chaos terminal was done when station eternity came out i think it's pretty close to being done i can't remember specifically i think it was pretty close to being done um already so it's coming out this november 
Uh, and that one was easier to write, um, you know, getting good support from my agent and uh, communicating better with the new editor. And, you know, she helped me fix the book into something that was better. Um, when I turned it in, I said, look, I know this is going to need a lot of work. And I look forward to your, you know, guidance in helping me get there. I like working with editors. Um, but yeah, the, the, the recent unpleasantness was, was affected me a lot. Yeah, I, I can see that. Uh, can you give us a little teaser for Chaos Eternity and then maybe tell us what you're working on now? Yes. Like Chaos Eternity. Chaos Terminal. Hey, <laughs> Chaos Terminal. Oh, well. Um, uh, some of the uh, people from uh, Mallory's past arrive at the station. Some of them we've we've met in Station Eternity. Some of them we haven't. Um, interestingly, one thing I did that I regret was making a... Um, Oh gosh, what's the word? Not it's not omnipotent is all powerful. What's all knowing? Omniscient. Omniscient. God, I'm a writer. I know the word. At certain times of the day, the words just yeah leave. They go home. Yeah. So you've, you've got an omniscient, sentient space station. It's hard to have a mystery above those. So you know, I had to take her out of it the first time, and then now we've got another murder. So I had to take out the omniscient person again another time mm -hmm. and uh so i had to figure out a new way to do that so i actually came up with two that that have happened which is one i'll tell you which is the host of the station leaves uh has to go away for a little while and so the station's kind of brought down to basic life support levels and uh then something else bad happens to her so as Mallory's looking at this murder, bigger things are happening to the station that she has to figure out. And we had some uh, rock people that broke some laws in the first book, and they're having to deal with their uh, the consequences of their actions as well. So we've got a lot of uh, political turmoil. And if you've read Station Eternity, I'll just tell you that Tina has to learn diplomacy, and that should scare you. So, oh dear, yes, I have read it. Yes, yes. Oh dear. so Tina gets to learn diplomacy. So that's those. Those are the teasers. Uh, people from Mallory's past. Tina learns and, diplomacy. Yeah, that one's scary. That one's yeah. scarier than you know <laughs> Jessica Fletcher meets Babylon Five. I'll tell you right there. <laughs> anyway, what are you working on now? A number three or uh, something? No, different? right now I'm just kind of I'm toying with a couple of ideas. Um, and I, I recently made a decision that as much as I love talking about what I'm working on, I have that problem of my brain kind of questioning it once I say yeah. it out loud. Yeah. Um, or some people have said this is a thing where if like with ADHD, if you talk about do talk about what something you're working on, your brain gets a sense that it's done. And so the desire to work on it. So I'm actually not talking about what I'm working on now. I am doing a couple of um experimental things i've just like toying with a couple of new ideas i uh haven't heard whether they officially want a book three yet i assume they do but we haven't talked about it i do have a three book deal with ace so um i do have a couple of uh book three ideas in my head but right now i'm just kind of writing on a couple of fun things so it's i'm enjoying it cool cool okay we're at the end of our hour together um is there anything you'd like to add uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, Chaos Terminal comes out in November. You can pre-order now. Uh, Station Eternity is available. And, um, yeah, I'm at merverse.com if you want to see any of the many things that I do. Podcasts, editing, novels, all that stuff. All the good stuff. All yes. the stuff we're here for. Well, thank you, Mer. Thank you. This was fun. Good. Good. And thank, I, I hope everybody out there is having fun, too. Thank you for joining us here for Continual.